Thanks so much for having me this morning. It really is uh, tremendous to be here. <clears throat> As I've uh, said to a few people since, uh, since flying into to Logan yesterday, and in a lot of ways it feels like coming home, uh, in part because my uh, family and I lived in the area during my, uh, during my master's program, and in fact, the first few months we lived just down the street in Beverly, and yes, commuted down to Cambridge every day. Uh, that didn't last very long. <laughs> But uh, it is good, uh, good to be back up here, uh, back up to the North Shore, where there's a Dunkin' Donuts in every corner. Uh, thank you. I'm, those of you who clapped, I'm deeply proud of you, believe me. I have my five-year-old daughter asking for Dunkin' Donuts, and I'm very proud of that as a father. Uh, but uh, it also does very much feel like coming home to, uh, to the Christian college setting, uh, both in terms of where I went to college. Uh, it seems like a very short time ago, but I guess the early 90s were not, <laughs> in fact, that, that near a time that I was uh, sitting in chapel just like you guys at, at Messiah, um, wondering when my chapel skips were going to kick in and how many I had left, but, uh, but experiencing what it means to be able to come together as a community during these times and, and to have this tremendous experience that I hope all of you are having uh, here at Gordon. Well. Uh, let me say one other quick thing. I, I don't mean at all for me to say too much about myself. That's absolutely not my point today. But let me say a very quick word about my background because there's a very particular point I want to get at before I start to talk about Christians in the Middle East. Um, uh, with, uh, with thanks for the very kind introduction by Dr. Alter and, 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 and after a very warm welcome from faculty and administration and students here. Um, as Dr. Alter mentioned, I've spent a number of years studying in the Middle East, living there, traveling around quite a bit, uh, and I also happen to be married into an, an, an Egyptian Christian family and have spent uh, years of my life dedicated to not just seeing the Middle East as this kind of two-dimensional area of dispassionate study and an object of curiosity, but very much part of my life. And so the things that I'm talking about um, I, I have a stake in them. They're very personal. Uh, again, it's not just speaking at a distance. Uh, in, in fact, uh, this is a uh, Coptic monk, if that word Coptic doesn't mean anything to, to all of you. Coptic is uh, Egyptian Christian. It actually comes from the Greek word Egyptos for, for, for Egypt. But uh, this is a Coptic monk. Monasticism, Christian monasticism, actually started in the deserts of Egypt and uh, this is at a monastery out in the deserts, about an hour and a half or so uh, west of Cairo. And uh, that's my daughter with the monk. <laughs> and uh, so I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that she's been able to run around in her sandals in Coptic monasteries. And not a lot of five-year-olds can say that. Uh, well, <clears throat> my talk today is, uh, uh, does Christianity have a future in the Middle East? And just to kind of dispel the suspense before we get going, my answer is yes. So I guess my work here is done. I'll let know. No, as you probably guess, I have a few more things to say about that. Uh, and, and in fact, um, the reality is not quite so simple as that. Uh, it is true that Middle Eastern Christians have survived much over the course of the last 2,000 years, uh, not just from being a minority uh, within a, a sizable Muslim majority surrounding them, uh, but uh, even before that, since almost just after the birth of Christianity, the, uh, Christians have faced hard times in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, the fact is that we have now entered a period over the last year in which Middle Eastern Christians are finding themselves once again on pretty uncertain footing. Uh, some places worse, some places perhaps a little bit better, but for the most part, at the moment, there's a real sense of concern, uh, anxiety, and in a lot of corners of the Middle East, fear among the Christian communities for what the coming years are, are, are going to have in store for them. And so in light of this, uh, my, my goal this morning with all of you is to do two things. Uh, first of all, I'd like to explain that, yes, there are Christians in the Middle East, millions of them, in fact, and describe some of the challenges that they're facing today, especially in light of the upheavals that have been going on around the Middle East over the course of the last year that are still often collectively referred to as the Arab Spring. That's the first thing I wanna do. The second thing I want to do is explain to you how it is that Christians are not strangers and aliens to the, to the Middle East, but in fact, they're an integral part of the social fabric of the Middle East. And to put it in other words, the Middle East needs its Christians 
And I'd like to talk a little bit about what it is they need to stick around and how it is that they remain a part of things. Well, we have a lot of different things within those two categories that we could talk about today, but we don't have a whole lot of time to do that. We could discuss Iraq, where the, the breakdown of security during the U.S. occupation uh, contributed to an explosion in sectarian violence. Uh, part of this led to Islamic extremists targeting Christian churches and leaders. Uh, between 2003 and 2010, churches were bombed, priests were kidnapped and killed, and by late 2010, the population of somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half million Christians had dropped to somewhere around 400,000. That's a drop of two-thirds of the entire community. Uh, most of those Christians fled their homes as refugees, some of them into the northern part of the country, into Iraqi Kurdistan, some of them over the border into Jordan, and others over the border into Syria, which um, those of you who pay attention to the news may know that there's a bit of a fight going on in Syria right now, and frankly, nobody knows what's going on with those Christian refugees in the east of the country. Uh, we could discuss the community of Palestinian Christians who, after 65 years of a rather intractable Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, Christians have in fact been emigrating for decades. And so it is that now there are more Palestinian Christians here in the U.S. than there actually are in the land of Christ himself. That's a pretty sad trend. And uh, coming back to Syria, we could also discuss that community where around two million Christians um, of various Christian denominations are faced with a pretty terrible choice to either support a brutal regime that has killed at least 10,000 people over the course of the last year, but at the same time has, oddly enough, uh, protected the, the freedom of worship of the Christian communities. Uh, it's a very complicated ethnic, religious context that we don't have too, too much time to get into, but it's this very difficult choice that Christians are are faced with. On the other hand, they're tremendously fearful that if they do support the opposition and rise up against the regime uh, with, with other Syrians, that when the dust settles, they may find themselves ruled by conservative Islamist parties, and they're none too excited about that prospect either. A third option remains, that if Syria continues to go as badly as it has been and, and spiral downward into sectarian violence, uh, there may be violent retribution against the regime, regime's allies or those that are perceived to be their allies, such as the Christians, and that would be a very dangerous thing indeed. I'll come back to Syria a little bit later. We could talk about all those things, but rather than give you too many statistics and throw out too much stuff, I'd rather focus in on the country of Egypt for the next few minutes, in part because it's the place that I know best uh, in the region. It's not only the most populous country in the Arab world, somewhere a little bit more than 80 million people, and it also has the region's biggest indigenous Christian community, and that's somewhere between 10 and 12 percent of the population, um, with apologies for the bad math. That means somewhere around 8 to 10 million people. That's a lot of Christians in one country in the Middle East that a lot of Americans and a lot of evangelicals don't know exist, not in that, that kind of number. Not only are there a lot of Christians in Egypt, but it is one of the most ancient communities of Christians in the world. Uh, it was uh, Mark the Evangelist. That is the very first generation of Christianity that brought the gospel to the city of Alexandria uh, somewhere around 68 AD. And that's not 1968, there's no apostrophe. That is 068 AD. There has been an unbroken Christian presence in Egypt. That's a pretty startling uh, figure. Well, uh, in the short term, coming very quickly up to the present, the, uh, the Arab Spring, the Egyptian Revolution, has in many ways not been very kind to Coptic uh, Egyptian Christians. Uh, in fact, before the revolution last year, uh, 2000 began in a horrific way. Uh, in that very same city of Alexandria, there was a church bombing in January of 2011 that killed 25 people, injured over 100, and we still aren't really sure who did it, and the government hasn't been very interested in pursuing the investigation. After the rather thrilling 18-day uprising that overthrew the country's dictator, uh, Hosni Mubarak, in January and February of last year, the country's security framework was left in, in tatters. Uh, 
And uh, in the ensuing period, there was a series of attacks on churches around the region, usually directed against church properties. And uh, usually those church attacks have been uh, led by mobs of people, again in this security vacuum, uh, very often inspired by overzealous, what we call Salafi, or kind of ultra-conservative hardline Islamists, um, uh, to, quote, put Christians in their place. Uh, we found this series of church attacks from all the way north in the Sinai to all the way down south in, in Aswan. And uh, there was a real series of several months where this was happening every few weeks, these sorts of uh, attacks. And this finally culminated in October when a group of several thousand Christians uh, marched on the state media, bu uh, uh, media building in the middle of Cairo, uh, angry over yet another church attack uh, down near the city of, uh, down in the, the uh, governorate of, of Aswan in southern Egypt. And the, uh, the transitional military government um, started to crack down in this protest uh, with a, a certain amount of religious bigotry involved in that because these were Christians that were getting out of their place and uh, began to brutally suppress this protest, uh, including uh, at one point running over some of those Christian protesters with their military transports uh, in a very, very bloody scene. Uh, this crackdown killed about 27 mostly Copts, that is mostly Egyptian Christians, and uh, at one point, a uh, state TV news anchor, in fact, got on TV and started calling out to Egyptian citizens to go in the streets and defend, quote, their army from the Christians. Uh, now, uh, most Egyptians are decent people, and very few people heeded that call, uh, thank goodness, uh, although there were a few young men that came down and, uh, and created a very unsettling scene after that violence uh, in front of the, the TV building. But uh, when the dust settled, 27 had been killed, and once again, no one has been held responsible. Well, in the long-term picture, the thing that's really got Egyptian Christians concerned, of course, is the fact that Islamist organizations, that is, uh, people who are looking to infuse into Egyptian governance a conservative Islamic ideology with things like, you know, installing Islamic law into, into a more rigid structure in Egyptian government to perhaps instituting more severe social restrictions. Um, Egyptian Christians are very fearful that those restrictions may include harsher restrictions against Christians on their ability to, to worship freely, to publicly participate in the life of, uh, of Egyptian society, um, and to really restrict basic religious freedoms, which have already been in a pretty sad state to begin with. That's a very, very quick snapshot, uh, snapshot of some of the challenges facing Egyptian Christians over the course of the last year. But really, Egypt kind of exemplifies some of the main challenges facing Christians around the region in general. Uh, and we can see those same trends reflected in different ways in some of the countries that I've already mentioned. So there are three really big challenges facing Christians, and they're all very closely interwoven together. Uh, first of all is, as I mentioned, this rise of Islamists to dominate the new political scene um, certainly has been bringing a more central role to Islamic organizations and ideology around the region. And uh, the truth is, no one really knows yet what that's going to mean because it's breaking completely new ground. Uh, with the exception of uh, perhaps Iran and Saudi Arabia, which are very idiosyncratic on the way they run their countries and aren't particularly models for other states to run. The truth is, is that these Islamist parties in places like Egypt, like in Syria, in Tunisia, and Libya, they haven't ever had the chance to run the show before, so people aren't really quite sure how it's going to work out. Some of them have promising things to say that are working to reassure the fears of Christians and other religious minorities. Some of them are saying very alarming things. And, uh, and so we need to keep a close eye on it. And in the meantime, Christians in various places around the Middle East are really quite worried about that. <clears throat> the, um, the, uh, the second thing, and again, it's closely related here, is the question of emigration. More Christians are talking about leaving the Middle East than they ever have before. And the reality is in the 21st century, People can leave when there's a problem. You know, if you went back 500 or 1,000 years ago, when there were problems facing Christian communities, they 
were forced to live with it, for better or for worse. They had to deal with it because there was nowhere to go. Well, in the 21st century, it's a fairly mobile world. If you're facing really harsh discrimination or persecution in your home country, you can apply for asylum, you can become a refugee, you can go somewhere else, sometimes to better conditions, sometimes not so much. Uh, but the reality is, is that emigration, leaving the Middle East, is a way out for some of difficult conditions. And more people are asking what might that entail than, than ever before. Um, and as I mentioned with the case of Iraq, um, ref, a refugee status and other sorts of asylums are already beginning to really rob some of the Middle East from its indigenous communities. Third, the greatest threat is and has always been social and political upheaval. And if nothing else, over the last year, we've had an awful lot of that in the Middle East. Uh, I, I, I'll try not to get overly historical for those of you who are math and biology majors in here. But the, uh, the experience of Middle Eastern Christians over the course of the last 2,000 years has been that when things are a mess in terms of how a place is being run and governed and organized, things get even messier for minorities. Sometimes that's religious minorities like Christians, sometimes that's ethnic minorities like Kurds and, and others. If you, don't, if you aren't quite convinced of that, one need only look to the example of Armenian Christians uh, who in 1915, as the Ottoman Empire was crumbling and falling into a very sad state of upheaval and instability, um, the Ottoman Empire cracked down on the Armenians. Again, a little bit of political instability infused with a touch of religious bigotry, and the end result was the killing of one and a half million Armenian Christians in, in eastern Anatolia and northern Syria in, in 1915, uh, what we refer to as the Armenian Genocide. Upheaval is a bad thing for Middle Eastern Christians. And the present era is no different. Direct religious and political violence has already forced hundreds of thousands of people in Iraq, uh, Christians that is, and exiles, refugees. And we have a lot of concerns about places, especially like Syria, where things are really beginning to unravel that that upheaval, that fragility in society is going to come back to wreak havoc on the local Christian communities. So, my other point that I want to, to make this morning, how is it that the Middle East needs Christians? Does it need Christians? Are Christians really just kind of victims tucked away in the corner of Middle Eastern societies or do they contribute something a little bit more? And I think by the way I say that, you can probably guess what I have to say about that. Actually, Middle Eastern Christians represent a great deal to the Middle East, and, and a region without its Christians will be a very sad place indeed. They represent a few things for Middle Eastern societies. One is reconciliation. Traditionally, Christians have very often played an important role as mediators when different religious tensions, different ethnic tensions, even sometimes local tribal fights uh, can become a mess. Christians have traditionally played a positive role. Let me give you one example of this. Oops. I'll come back to that slide in a moment. Ah, my love-hate relationship with technology continues. Ah. Let me give you one example from Syria. This isn't a story that you'll find particularly well documented. Uh, in fact, you won't find any documentation on it at all because it was always very embarrassing for the Syrian government. In 2004, there was a soccer match out in one of the eastern provinces of the country, and it was basically a soccer match from a town uh, with the two teams were comprised of one town's team that was mostly ethnic Kurds. The other team was from a place that was mostly Sunni Arabs. And there's always been tension between these communities for a variety of reasons. And after the soccer match, uh, it erupted into a riot, all this kind of ethnic tension, and turned out to be something pretty violent and began to spread to other parts of eastern Syria. And this was one of the rare occasions where the Syrian government couldn't quite stop it. Maybe it was because this was 2004, the Syrian government was still pretending it could reform, it was concerned about how it looked in the world. Maybe it just didn't want to crack down like it is today on this kind of violence. But the reality is, couldn't do a whole lot about these riots that were flaring up all over the place. Well, they called in the Christians. 
And a Syrian Orthodox bishop was called in to mediate, and so he brought together a number of Kurdish and Sunni Arab tribal leaders uh, from these eastern provinces, brought them into his church, and locked the door, and spent, uh, I, I don't want to try to pretend how many hours, but I know that it was at least, uh, at, at least six hours. I'm going to say a little bit more, but don't quote me on that. That they spent behind these locked doors, and finally they opened the doors, and the, this uh, Syrian Orthodox bishop came out with these tribal leaders to announce uh, that they were calling to their communities to stop the violence immediately, uh, to their tribes, to their communities, to their families, to their towns, and uh, lo and behold, the violence subsided. And that was a settlement that was mediated by a Syrian Orthodox bishop. Christians in the Middle East represent forgiveness, and yes, even sometimes joy. Let me give you one example. After the um, rather horrific events that I, that I mentioned um, where the military attacked Christian protesters in October of last year, just a little over a week later, the Christians had their response. Now, there were a few days of, of uh, prolific tears, asking questions why. There was some well-deserved international attention on this incident. It was pretty well covered in the press if you go and look back to October of last year. It's often referred to as the Maspero Massacre, Maspero being the name of the state TV building. But the Christians responded about a week later, uh, not with another protest, although they've been part of plenty of those, but they responded by holding a prayer meeting. This was a prayer meeting that they called, um, as it's, well, I've got it written up there, don't I? Uh, which means a night of prayer for returning to God. And I'm going to show you this little bit of a, just a few seconds of this prayer meet, prayer and worship meeting, really. And then I want to explain something to you about the significance of this place, because it's a pretty cool story, actually. Sorry for the bad resolution here. Those are tens of thousands of people if you can't quite make out the heads. Let me tell you something about this church. I love wireless microphones. <laughs> I can never stand in one place for too long. Let me tell you something about this church. This is uh, actually in a monastery called the Monastery of St. Simon the Tanner, and it's in a place called Mokatam. If you ever see pictures of the city of Cairo, um, uh, it's got this big rock outcropping that's called the Mokatam Mountains, uh, right alongside the... the um, Eastern, <laughs> trying to think of my geography here, on the eastern side of the city of Cairo. And uh, there's this really fascinating story, uh, a tradition that the church holds that goes back to, the, uh, back to the late 10th century. And by local tradition, uh, Coptic Christians believe that there was a, a, a caliph, an, an Islamic ruler, who had just recently come to control Egypt, a dynasty called the Fatimids, and that this caliph... Um, he had hosted a debate between religious leaders. It was not an uncommon thing to get together, to have leaders get together and, and discuss theology. And uh, after this, he, after this meeting where apparently the, the Christian patriarch was kind of showed everybody up with his knowledge of theology. Afterward, this caliph was told about uh, scripture saying that if you know someone has. Uh, faith the size of mustard seed, they could move mountains. And he said, well, I wonder if the Christians take that seriously. So he went to the patriarch and said, okay, I'm going to put you to the test. 
uh, I want you guys to pray that God moves Mukata Mountain. And if you can't move it by praying, then that means you don't have faith, that means your faith isn't real, and I'm gonna kill you guys. Kind of a, that's as ultimatum as you can possibly get. By tradition, the patriarch was a little bit freaked out, as you can imagine, began to very fervently pray, and God led him to this tanner, uh, right, this, this leather worker, who was, he was kind of, a, kind of a crazy guy. As the story goes, he so believed in, in scripture that he once looked at a girl kind of a little bit funny, and so he literally plucked his own eye out. Maybe we wouldn't want to have dinner with the guy, but he was an interesting figure nonetheless. So this Simon said, what are we waiting for? And he began to gather together the community. They went over to, uh, uh, to the mountain, and as a congregation began to prostrate themselves in prayer to God until the mountain was literally raised from its foundations. Uh, now, what, what you want to make of that tradition, I'll leave that to you. Certainly local Christians believe, uh, believe that account fervently. And Makatam has always kind of had this interesting place in Coptic tradition because of that. Well, some years back, this was back in the early uh, 90s or late 80s, um, there had been for several decades by that point a very, very poor, and I mean poor community that of, of mostly Christians that had begun to live at the, at the foot of this mountain. It's a place called Garbage City, and it's just as bad as it sounds. It's a place where all the garbage collectors of the city of Cairo grab all the garbage from, from the city, bring it to this community in dump trucks full of this trash, piled way up in, into the air. They literally bring it into their community, plop it down, and then begin to sort through it to see if there's stuff that they can use. Some of it gets burned, some of it gets recycled. It's a, it's a pretty awful place in many ways. And the, the Christians felt that they needed some opportunity to minister to these local Christians. And so they wanted to build this Orthodox church and surround it with a monastery. Uh, Coptic Orthodox tradition has a real heart for the monastic tradition. It's at a, the real core of Coptic identity. Uh, so the problem was they couldn't get a permit to build a new church. That's always been a problem in Egypt, getting permission to build a church. If you've got one, you can usually have the freedom to pray and worship inside of it as, as you like, but getting permission is a little bit different. So what they did, rather than build a church, they just removed stone from the Mokata mountain and kind of got around those building permits. Uh, legend has it, in fact, that they had to blow a few caves out of, the, out of the side of the mountain and they would put the dynamite in during the month of Ramadan when cannons would go off, fake cannons, to proclaim the start of the, uh, the breaking of the fast every night. They would blow the dynamite at the same time that the cannons were going off. I don't know whether that's true, but it's kind of a cool story. Uh, at the end, the end result was this magnificent cave church that was built in the side of Mokata Mountain. And it's a pretty remarkable place because it's a place where there's been real revival going on within the Coptic Orthodox Church. If you go there on a, on a typical worship night, which happens a couple of times a week, you'll find tens of thousands of people. Um, if we can think of it this way, it's almost like an Orthodox Pentecostal service. Uh, well, the main, the main chapel service, or the main chapel room, massive, massive uh, gathering hall that can hold at least 25,000 people is where they held this night of prayer for returning to God. And it was joined by Coptic Orthodox, by Protestants, Evangelicals, Catholics, other people among the Christian, uh, Egyptian Christian community that came out for this a really remarkable response for what had just been a week before a very brutal and horrific night for a lot of Egyptian Christians. That was their response. It was a response with forgiveness and with joy. Well, the other thing that um, Christians represent for the Middle East is hope for all peoples in the region. Let me explain what I mean by this. Ramaz Atala, who is the head of the Bible Society of Egypt, did a couple of interviews last fall, which were in many ways somewhat controversial for people in my line of work, uh, in, who work in religious freedom. But uh, he, he's, he's a good guy, and he does some really amazing work with the Bible Society of Egypt, um, very boldly and very publicly uh, in different parts of the country. And he had uh, this to say in one of these interviews, the big struggle here, in Egypt that is, is not between Christians and Muslims. The big struggle here is between Muslims and Muslims. 
The reality is, is that falling into Islamist rule won't just mean likely greater restrictions on the lives of Middle Eastern Christians, although it most probably will, but also on the lives of majority Muslim communities. In other words, of their Muslim neighbors. There will probably be more restrictions on the lives of Muslim women if a conservative interpretation of Islamic laws implemented in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, and elsewhere. In other words, if greater freedom can be achieved for Christian communities in the Middle East, that can only come about through a social and political framework that respects the rule of law, that respects individual conscience, that respects religious freedom, and that respects, above all these things, citizenship. That's not a word we probably hear in chapel too often, uh, but for a community like the communities of Middle Eastern Christians, the reality is they need more than anything else to be treated like everyone else, like equal members of society who have the same rights and responsibilities of everyone regardless of whether they're Christian or Muslim. And so we come to the final question in, in this context, what do Middle Eastern Christians need? And let me give you a few things to suggest that you can pray for. First and foremost, is I'd ask you to pray for perseverance for Middle Eastern Christians throughout the Middle East, that they would have courage, that they'd have strength, that they'd have patience, boldness, that they would not leave, that they would not emigrate, that they would remain there and remain an important part of the fabrics of their communities. Like I said before, they're not just victims. They are part, they are members of their societies, and the Middle East needs them. And in line with that, please pray that God would provide Middle Eastern Christians with the means to stay, to make their presence, their importance clear and understood by their Muslim neighbors. I'd also ask you to pray for open-minded Muslims in the region, and there are many of them, that their voices would be heard as well, that their voice of reason is not drowned out and the newfound confidence of Islamists around the region in this era of uprisings, that they too could argue for the rights of Middle Eastern Christians. These things are the best hope for the long-term survival of our brothers and sisters in Christ in the region, the same region into which Christianity and, of course, Christ himself was born. I'd like to conclude, if I may, if you would all indulge me by standing with me, I'd like to read to you, I'd like to say recite, but I have a terrible memory. I'd like to read for you the Lord's Prayer in, in Arabic. And you should be able to hopefully follow along at least with the cadence of it. Abana aladi fis samawati, liyatta qaddas ismuka, liyatti malakutuka, لَتَاكُنْ مَشِيَأَتُكَ كَمَا فِي السَّمَاءِ كَذَلَكَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ خُبْزَنَا كَفَافَنَا عَتَنَا الْيَوْمِ وَاغْفِرْ لَنَا ذُنُوبَنَا كَمَا نَغْفِرْ نَحْنُ أَيْدًا لِلْمُذْنِبِينَ إِلَيْنَا وَلَا تُدْخِلْنَا فِي تَجْرِبَةٍ لَكِنْ نَجِّنَا مِنْ الشَّرِيرِ لِأَنَّ لَكَ الْمُلْكَ وَالْقُوَّةَ وَالْمَجْدَ إِلَى الْأَبَدِ آمِينٌ that means amen. Thank you.